Well, hello, everyone. I am here today with Jonathan Miracle, and uh, Jonathan was with us on Sunday. Uh, I thought it would be a wonderful idea for he and I to have a conversation to follow that up. Uh, we had him come Sunday, not just to do a service, but to build a relationship yep. and to uh, ha have you help us figure out what does, what does it mean to move forward in this conversation of loving our Indigenous friends, uh, in sharing the gospel, in listening to the stories in, a, in, a, in an effective and, and appropriate manner. And uh, for those of us that were here Sunday, it was a powerful and impactful Sunday. And there's always that mixed feeling for 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 guys like me, where you feel guilt and you feel uh, confusion and there's a bit of hope mixed in because you think, okay, we can do better because we can. Yeah. What would you say to, to that? What, what is the, the first baby step forward or some baby steps that we can take in the way we view things and in, in things that we can actually do um, to, to not just talk about it, not just think about it, but actually engage in this process? Well, I think you touched on something there in that, you had mixed feelings like um, how you felt as I was sharing. But, but you know, things don't go ahead without some struggle. You know, there has to, we have to be able to hear the hard stuff as well as the ho hopeful stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I looked around as I shared uh, on Sunday and, and uh, saw a lot of tears mm. throughout the place. And really, if people are being touched that deeply, then something good is happening. And the, the thing is, is, is for people to be able to engage with those emotions and not push them away. And so that's why, you know, given an hour, um, if I can help people to understand the plight of our First Nations people and to become involved in that plight in their own personal and individual lives, it's going to benefit Canada. There's ultimately, we want it to benefit this country. We want it to benefit First Nations people. And we want the whole country to be blessed by it. Because there's so much to be realized from the gifts that are within the First Nations community that up to this point have literally been hidden. Mm. And so now what we need to do is we need to harvest those good things. And at the same time, establish self-respect and dignity among our First Nations people. And like you're saying, um, so how do we do that? Well, it's by engaging. It's by like at your, uh, on your, for your Sunday program uh, service, I shared stories. Stories are part of the culture of First Nations. I mean, everybody loves stories. There's storybooks all over civilization, but First Nations people are oral societies. Right. And it doesn't mean we're dumb. <laughs> right. It means that we chose a different route. And the route was to expand our memories. So what happened is, is when you have an oral society, what people need to realize is there is a whole other type of intellectual development that takes place when people learn orally because you have to keep a strong memory. You have to be able to remember things and to think about things. So um, <clears throat> with First Nations people, uh, storytelling was a, a very important thing. And, and sitting at the feet of elders and learning from elders is, is vital. So, you know, my encouragement is spend time listening, mm. a little more time listening and hearing the stories of the people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, time, it's a gift of time, I yeah. guess, right? And, and, and showing that, that respect and appreciation by saying your time is valuable, uh, yep. or you're valuable enough for me to give you my time yep. and to listen. That's it. That's not, it right not, there. Yeah, yep, I, I like that. I, on Sunday, if you didn't watch on Sunday, we had the kids sitting on the floor and uh, you were telling a story that you yep. had heard growing up. Yep. Um, it is interesting. That's not foreign to our culture, but it, it definitely is celebrated better in other cultures around yep. the world. The idea yep. of storytelling specifically from the elders and the older folks yep. to the younger folks. And there's, there's something beautiful when you include different generations. And that's it. That's part of the key here is that within First Nations culture, another one of the gifts is our people had a, a better relationship between our elders and our children. And, and the relationship across the generations was stronger because of our community lifestyle um, where we work together. Mm. Um, the, the grandparents looked after the children. 
you know. And so often the children, by the time they were 13 years old, had wisdom that they gained from their grandparents. Mm. And they didn't look down on them. They weren't allowed to speak bad about them or speak bad to them <laughs> or be mouthy. So the culture, the culture was uh, all about sharing mm. across the generations. Right. And, you know, sometimes I think we need to come up with a little bit different model within the modern church and try to include things within the church that bring the generations closer together. Because, I mean, how many, like 90% of the churches, 99% of the churches I go to, they come and then they separate. Hmm. Everybody goes to their different, according to their age group. Right, right. You know, you got the young adults, you got the seniors, you got the children, and they all want to hear it their way. But the truth is, if we want to be a healthy community, we need to learn how to interact in those mm-hmm. Uh, environments. And there's something wonderful too about involving uh, kids in the process and letting them speak into that process or ask questions Absolutely. or even lead uh, my girls in, in what they're learning in school about Canadian history and, and about things that I didn't learn about and I'm catching up on. Yeah. I'm having beautiful conversations and they're helping me have that conversation. And I know as a pastor, I want our church to have those conversations and not fall behind. I don't, I don't want my kids saying, how come we're not having these important conversations yeah. in church? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's been good. Do you, are you encouraged by the conversations that you're hearing in churches? I mean, I'm sure there's pockets of good and there's pockets of not so good, but are you encouraged? Do you think more conversations are happening? Oh, yeah. You know, since the, since the sacrifices were found in Kamloops, the, the, the issues that took place there when they found all of our children. And now they're finding them in residential schools all across the country. Apparently, the numbers are getting pretty exponential at this point. Um, but I mean, when you think of school, you don't think of death, you think of life. You think right. of the vibrancy of life, right? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, and to know that because of that, there has been a stirring up of the desire for Canada to come good, for Canada to recognize. And, you know, for me, I've always said the church needs to be the tip of the arrowhead. The church needs to be leading the way. And right now, I believe the church is in an attemptive state to lead the way. Um, I believe that other facets of the political and educational and judicial communities are stepping up. They're all stepping up. They're all going, hey, we've really rocked this boat. It's time that we start to figure out how to fix it. And the church needs to be in in step, but it needs to be in step up front. We are the spiritual leaders of this land. The church is supposed to be in leadership spiritually. We're the we're the people that people turn to when there's death, when there's life, when there's marriage. We're the people that guide the, the whole of society. Mm. It doesn't matter. A politician still gets married and usually by a priest or a pastor. Um, so we're, we're in that place. We're one of the, one of the leaders in the, in the country of uh, the way we go. So my thought is, is that our churches need to be encouraged to step up. I think almost to the point of where wouldn't it be wonderful to have just leaders gatherings cross denominational where pastors get together and discuss this stuff and have people like me come in mm. and help them? Because if we can do this, like, you know, your leadership conference was a beautiful place for me to have touched the hearts of so many pastors all at once. And, and the ongoing effect of that has been really good for me because I'm realizing that, that this, uh, group of people really desires to make change. And really, you guys didn't have anything to do with the residential schools, but you guys are taking responsibility along with everybody else. And this is what's vital, that we're willing to lay down the pride, the arrogance, or whatever it might be, and we're able to say, let's get it fixed as lovers of Jesus. Let's get it fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, One of the things that you were talking about that got me excited because I I love worship and and, uh, you shared some of your music, which was fantastic, but you talked about worshiping with other indigenous uh, people from around the world. And this conversation is a Canadian conversation. It's uh, a North American church conversation, but it's it's bigger than that. Tell me a little bit about uh, some of those interactions because I I Uh, thought that was wonderful. I think it was in... 
2000, early 2000s, um, there was a, 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 a vision by a man named Monty Ohia in uh, New Zealand about gathering together the indigenous people who are lovers of Jesus, gathering us together across the world to come together. And he started a movement called the World Christian Gathering on Indigenous People. And so indigenous people came from around the world to the first gathering in Rotorua, uh, New Zealand. And it was pretty incredible uh, to have all these different cultures represented. And they weren't worshiping from the Euro-American posture, but they were worshiping from their cultural expressions, whether they were from Africa or whether they were from Scandinavia or they're from South America, North America. Every one of them came with their own beautiful mm. regalia, their own music style, their own uh, ways of rhythm, their dance. And see, dance within the Aboriginal community is a part of worship. Within the non-native community, that's one of the things that First Nations people have such a difficult time with, is how we worship our creator is a big part of it is through the expressive dance. You know, and within the church, as we know it, you know, there are special dance groups that come up and do a special number and they'll dance to a song. And that's all well and good. But, but with First Nations, when you come into a First Nations gathering, everybody's going to dance. And everybody's going to dance with that same desire to honor the Creator. And so I was explaining how, you know, we have different dances for different, different things, different things that are happening in life. Dances for healing, dances for victory, dances for uh, um, prosperity, dances for uh, all different types of uh, relationship, dances for social right. gatherings. So dance, we, we call it, we dance our prayers. And we say that each step is a prayer for healing or for whatever the dance is meant for. And, and on Sunday, I talked about the, the father's dance because fathers have been so emaciated in this in, in North America. Fathers have lost in so many cases within the system have lost their leadership roles within their families. And so within First Nations communities, especially because fathers were heroes in the First Nations community. Fathers were the great hunters. Father, okay. father went out and did these things and would supply for his family and do all these wonderful things. And there was a sense of pride that gave him, uh, you yeah. know, he was yeah. happy about himself, right? Well, when everything changed and, and we're forced to live in small reservations and communities, our purpose became diluted. And so with that, alcohol, drug abuse, and all those things took its toll. And so fatherhood has fallen by the wayside. And so I cry when I go into villages and I see our fathers in such terrible shape. And so I wrote the song, The Father's Dance. Mm. And so it's... You know, for me, it's an official song to say, fathers, we're dancing. Every step we take is a dance for the restoration of true fatherhood to come back. You know, be a part of your families, guide your families, lead your families, pray with your families. But fathers, come home to your families. Mm. <clears throat> That's, a, that's a, a, a blessing, a beautiful blessing and a prayer. Uh, as dads, we've, we chatted a little bit about our kids even yeah. during this uh, conversation. Um, one of the things that has struck me as we've talked is is some of the conversation is about unique indigenous challenges that 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 your brothers and sisters are facing uh, that we are facing as Canadians but but the other thing that became clear is these challenges are not unique to first nations that that identity poverty uh, um, um, you know uh, all, all of the conversation we're having affects all of creation, affects all people in different ways. But, but there's an opportunity for the church to, to set a, a bit of an example of how to address this mm -hmm. in loving and blessing our indigenous brothers and sisters that will have a ripple effect on the way that we see all people as children of God. Right. Well, all across... All across the world, there's different dynamics that are taking place. And here in Canada, we have our own specific dynamic that actually spills over into America as well because they're, they're having the same issues over there and discovering their boarding school situations mm -hmm. and they're discovering the same situations took place there. Um, but yeah, I believe that um, as the church, we need to uh, step up and begin to listen 
I think one of the most important parts uh, of the church is that we've always been the ones who have spoken. We have been very slight on the listening. You know, pastor's always pra practicing his sermon and getting his sermon ready. He's going to speak to everybody and then it's going to be over and everybody goes home. But within the First Nations community, part of our way we do it is there's interaction. So, you know, people speak and people listen. We have what's called talking circles. And so, you know, uh, a lot of people will get into the circle and we'd have an eagle feather or something to represent this is the person speaking. And no one else speaks when that person is speaking. And they're able to speak their heart about anything that they want to say. Just imagine how much more uh, the community can interact and interweave if we actually understand each other on that kind of level. Mm. Um, and so we're, we're, I'm, I'm sort of hosting something like that too as well where um, I'm bringing many people together and opening the door for interrelationship where we have like six talking circles going at the same time and we have uh, different groups of people going into them and they're just learning from one another. I mean, you've had experiences that I haven't had right. and your experience can help me not to trip and fall. And my experience can help you not to trip and fall, you know, or it can help us to succeed in a much easier or a better way. And so, you know, it's another one of those, one of those beautiful gifts. And I believe the church is one of those places that we really need to move it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think we could talk, we could keep talking for a long time. And uh, certainly we have, we've had some wonderful phone calls and Zoom conversations. And I know yeah. our friendship has been a blessing to me. And, mm. and I am so excited about the message that you are not just bringing to us, but that you are taking to other places. But yeah. also I'm excited to hear what God is doing and, and your ability to come back and let us know what you see God doing in, in different places that you go and, and, and uh, people that you are sharing truth and, and love with. And discovering that God is at work. And yeah. so uh, yeah. I'm sure there are some tough days, but, but there must be some great days where yeah. you're just wonderfully blown away by, by God doing some great things right in front of you. I got to be, I got to be honest with you. I I've seen enough miracles to keep me on track. Hmm. I've seen enough community changes. I've seen enough lives turned over to Jesus. I've seen enough healing. I mean, I, actually prayed for people that were on their deathbed and seen them. The next time I flew through the community, I flew into Sioux Lookout. This girl came running up to me. She goes, I was going to die and you prayed for me. Oh, and now awesome. look at me. I'm fine. And, and her mom was crying while she sees wow. me in the airport. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's something to be said about being faithful. I'm not trying to exalt myself. I'm just saying for all of us. Mm -hmm. Be faithful to what you know about Jesus. Don't put Jesus on the back burner in, in different situations, but keep that love constantly in your heart and aim towards sharing that love with everybody around you. That's, what, yeah. a, what an awesome way to wrap up this conversation. Hopefully just one of many more yeah. to come. Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you this week. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you in the near future. God bless. God bless you. Love you.